So he'll be debating for a Christian foundation society. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Deb from the Sackler Society, wearing the wrong society shirt. Um, our representative is uh, Tom Sheldon, he's a second year law student. Um, our moderator is uh, Suresh, he is president of the Debater Union. So, yeah. <laughs> Might as well get into it then. Um, I believe everyone's aware of the motion today. Um, I guess Phil will be going first. If that's okay by him. Yeah. That's fine. Um, before we do, can we just get a quick hands up about, uh, for example, who who's in favour of being Christian morals? Um, as is all right. High up in the air, so I can count them. Tough audience. <laughs> All right. And uh, the secular audience. <coughs> and are there any abstentions? Undecideds? Right then. Okay. Um, so it's 25 to 16 in favor of uh, Christian. Christians, yep. Um, <laughs> so without any further ado, the House recognises Phil to open this case. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Secular Society and the Christian Union for organising this debate um, on an issue that seems to be perennially relevant, but increasingly so uh, in our own country and elsewhere today. Um, as for the uh, motion, I believe, um, although I may be wrong, that Secular Society actually came up with the wording for the motion we're debating this evening, and I think it's a very good one. I find particularly interesting the use of the word foundation here. What does it mean to say that Christianity or secularism provides a better foundation for our society? A foundation of society could mean many things. Does it refer to some body of constitutional law? Um, or perhaps to a set of institutions, or to a shared set of moral, philosophical and political convictions. In our own increasingly atomist and diverse society, it becomes very hard for us to talk about shared moral, philosophical, political and ultimately religious beliefs, particularly since so many of us have so many different beliefs. Just think that Christianity and secularism are not the only words that could be in this debate motion. They're not the only two candidates available for thinking about the foundation of a society, although I would like to suggest that they are respectively the two most preferable options. And so, um, first of all, I would like to make it clear that in arguing for Christianity as a better foundation for society, there are some things which I'm not arguing for. Firstly, I'm not arguing about whether Christianity is true or not, and I hope that members of the Christian Union who are here aren't too disappointed by that. Uh, Christianity does happen to be true, and you can come talk to me afterwards if you want to discuss why that is the case, uh, but it could conceivably be true without necessarily being the best foundation for a society. Now I say this at the start because I don't want Christians to feel that they have to vote for what I'm arguing, and I don't want atheists, agnostics and others to feel that they can't vote for what I'm arguing. Um, so please, when we vote, uh, remember the question isn't, are you a Christian or not? Uh, but the question is, which is a better foundation for society? Secondly, I'm not arguing for a state where Christianity is enforced. It would be laughable if it weren't so abhorrent to imagine that the coercive power of the state could produce a love of God in one's neighbour. Secularists are rightly frightened of what's called theocracy, and so am I. Sometimes the debate about religion and politics gets so polarised that it gets turned into democracy versus theocracy, which isn't helpful. If it helps to reassure anyone who's worried, I don't want the police chasing up people who skip church, I certainly wouldn't burn any heretics, and the last thing I'd expect to bring back is the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody. Okay. <laughs> Third, I don't mean that there's one detailed Christian account of politics. There are some principles I'm hoping to come on to, with plenty of room to be pragmatic about how we work those out. I'm not in favour of a Christian political party. 
you won't find the constitution for a Christian state or the political manifesto for a Christian party in the Bible. I do think that Christians should vote, uh, and Christians I respect vote for a range of political parties in this country when it comes to polling day. I myself happen to be an active member of a political party, one which has members of MPs, members and MPs of various different religious backgrounds, <coughs> or none, and with which I find plenty to agree with as a Christian, but which sometimes makes me uneasy or gives me cause to disagree. When it comes to actual policies, you'll find Christians disagree on the detail, even when they have the same guiding principles, and that's probably a very good thing. So, with those out of the way, what am I suggesting by the claim that Christianity provides a better foundation for society than secularism? I'd like to put forward that Christianity, while not itself a detailed political program, does provide us for the basis for a just, tolerant and flourishing society and can provide a satisfactory and coherent account of the values necessary to build and sustain such a society. What kind of values are these? I suggest that Christianity offers values which will lead to a just, tolerant and flourishing society in its account of the human person and its account of the role of the governing authorities, the state. Christians have or should have an attitude of dignity and value for every human being viewing them as created in God's image, an image bearing that is nowhere in the Bible restricted to believers, and that is reaffirmed in the man Jesus Christ. Yet we should also view ourselves humbly as fallible and indeed fallen beings. As such, we know that utopia cannot be achieved by our own efforts alone. Progress is not inevitable. This frees us to work with what we have and what we find in a broken and needy world. We know too that human beings are precious and not merely animate objects to be used to our own ends, nor are they simply dispensable with when they outlive their usefulness. A Christian society ought to care for the poor, the needy and the sick. It ought to care about human dignity and protect its citizens from exploitation or injustice. Finally, it provides a strong and coherent basis for a respect for all human life. When it comes to the state, Christians again should hold a nuanced view. The authorities of this world are called to be, and indeed can be, great forces for good. Government is not always illegitimate, rather it is intended to bring justice, wisdom, order and healing to society. However, it is only ever provisional and penultimate in its authority, and Christians believe rulers will one day be held to account themselves. This means that a society with Christianity at its foundation should seek, to do, should seek to do good and act justly with the resources of the state, but will not be naive as to the dangers of power, and should remain vigilant, speaking out against state-sponsored injustice, corruption or oppression. When it comes to the state, Christianity has another contribution to make, and one which may surprise you. The church does not have to be the same thing as the state. Today we take this for granted and many of us believe that it was a product of the Enlightenment. However, it actually goes much further back in the Christian tradition, all the way back to the New Testament. The kingdom of heaven is not to be identified with any temporary political order and the church itself can properly carry on its work in all manner of political realities. So for the Christian, because only God is truly and finally sovereign, the state should know its place and acknowledge that it is not the source, not the source of absolute truth, nor the sole or highest object of its citizens' loyalty. Therefore the state should withhold its judgment as to whom its Christians should worship and how. This means that a Christian society in fact has a proper basis for religious tolerance. It has a proper basis for full and equal citizenship for those who do not share the Christian faith, something that cannot be said for all religions, nor indeed for some historical incarnations of secularism. In fact, it could be that Christianity provides a reason to promote what is most attractive and valuable in secularism, this kind of procedural secularism, this kind of procedural secularism which seeks not to privilege any particular religious viewpoint over another when it comes to the affairs of the state. 
yet it will do so without the totalizing and anti-religious zeal of what might be called strong or programmatic secularism, whereby all religious claims are excluded from the public square and relegated to private opinions. Of course, there are many secularists who wish also to promote a just, tolerant and flourishing society, along the lines mentioned previously, and no one in this room would wish to deny that. Since secular governments tend at least to reflect the religious morality and society that they have grown out of, or perhaps replaced, which is why Ben Ali's <coughs> secular Tunisia looks so different, or looked so different from the secular European states, could we not just take the tolerance and cares for persons which we've inherited from the Christian tradition and incorporate it into a secular society without all of the religious and theological um, packaging that goes along with it? Well, that is indeed the question which we have to deal with tonight. The question is whether or not we can take the fruit of the Christian tradition and dispense with the tree itself, whether we can, whether we can take uh, the ideals of respect for human persons um, and um, a just and flourishing society um, provided by the Christian tradition um, without indeed referring to God, whether we can have the Christian vision of hope without the Christian God. Or whether we will find, if we try and do so, we will find that these cherished values, this fruit of the Christian tradition, will wither and rot when taken away from the source. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. The House now recognises Tom to open the case for the second House. I'd also like to start by thanking the organisers, Secular Society and Christian Society. It's um, nice to see us be able to come together to debate um, an issue which is clearly very important now and has always been. Um, I'd also like to clarify that we're not debating the veracity of religion, as Phil has already pointed out. Um, although it does seem that my fellow debater acknowledges the importance of separation between church and state, Although he feels the need to base this on scripture, um, a reason I hope to show you in this debate is frankly unsatisfactory and can cause harm uh, as an, a sole reason for, for uh, supporting a motion. Um, he also spoke about um, taking the fruit from the tree of Christianity. Um, I hope to show you tonight that that is indeed possible, although we would want to do this not because it came from Christianity. I would say there are many rotten apples on the tree of Christianity as well, um, which um, can be separated, but on the basis of secular, humanist, rational morality, and not because of scripture. Um, so I'll get to the meat of it now. Um, the Bible, the teachings of Jesus, and the Christian faith in general preach many honourable and truly moral practices. They condemn stealing and murder, promote loving thy neighbour, and Jesus lays down the fundamental principle that you should always treat your neighbour and another in a way that you would like to be treated yourself, the golden rule. However, there are many instances in the Bible where these principles are seemingly abandoned, and many examples of historical and contemporary atrocities perpetuated or condoned in the name of Christianity. I'm here to argue that religion is not needed for morality, and that in a secular society we can have the freedom to base our civilization around only those values which truly promote human flourishing and abandon the archaic principles found in the Bible for evidentially supported rational thinking. To suggest that there can be no better basis for society than Christianity, and that the Bible is a perfect source of morality, is simply not true. To those who believe the Bible to be a perfect source of moral guidance, I ask you to imagine if the Bible had been different. Let's suppose, in an alternate reality, the following did not appear in Deuteronomy 22, 28. If a man is caught in the act of raping a young woman who is not engaged, he must pay 50 pieces of silver to her father. Then he must marry the young woman because he violated her, and he will never be allowed to divorce her. I'd like to clarify, that is only what happens if a young woman is raped in a field. If they're raped in a city, then unless they scream out, they must be put to death. Can it really be contended that the Bible would be somehow less perfect with that omission? 
What about the following highly enlightening statement found also in Deuteronomy 25.11? If two men, a man and his countryman, are struggling together, and the wife of one comes near to deliver her husband from the hand of the one who is striking him, and puts out her hand and seizes his genitals, then you shall cut off her hand, you shall show no pity. Can it really be said that this quite irrelevant and immoral, well, amoral statement is somehow necessary to God's work and that without it, it would be incomplete and our moral code weakened? Within the framework of Christianity, the good simply cannot be separated from the bad in a logically consistent manner. No doubt there's plenty of both. But in secularism, it imposes no preset restrictions on what may be deemed moral or immoral. In a secular society, we're free to ask the question, does this practice promote human flourishing? And if so, adapt it as a moral precept, without having to clumsily reinterpret scripture to suit our needs. While there are many amicable quotations and moral rules laid down in both testaments of the Bible, and while Jesus' teachings are largely compatible with modern civilised standards of ethics, the Bible and the teachings of Christianity are by no means perfect and by no means the best foundation for society. From persecuting thousands of Jews and non-believers during the Inquisitions, which, as Phil has pointed out, I'm sure none of us want to see happen again, but still it's on Christianity's record, and I think it's worth mentioning, to justifying the brutalization of the mentally ill during the mass hysteria of the early modern era witch trials, Christian dogma and intolerant belief has been the cause of many atrocities in the past. Yes, the vast majority of Christians now denounce such extreme views, they do so by applying secular moral principles to such statements and rejecting them as inconsistent with rational values and their conscience. The way Christians now interpret love thy neighbour is far more inclusive and, and less divisive than it once was. But the enlightenment and advances in non-religious moral philosophy can, can be attributed to this. The text of the Bible hasn't changed in 2,000 years, but our values have, and it's important society is formed around a system which allows us to take on new discoveries and enlighten our ethics. There are many issues on which mainstream Christian position, however, has yet to catch up with reasoned secular morality, and it is not enough to say that most Christians are now, on the whole, more tolerant and reasonable than their predecessors. Christian missions to Africa, specifically Catholic Christian missions to Africa, spread lies about the effectiveness of condom use to prevent the spread of AIDS, causing untold suffering and death in the region. The teaching of the fact of evolution is still suppressed and creationism promoted in science classes at faith schools and countless gay and transsexual people are still persecuted in the name of Christianity and by many prominent Christian uh, leaders for no better reason than their behaviour is unnatural, according to scripture. <clears throat> Most predominantly and disturbingly of all, however, is the manner in which Christianity instills its morality into its followers and their children, who are too young, rightly, to be considered Christian at all. Fear. On the basis of making people behave ethically, Christianity routinely mentally scars young children with images of hellfire and tells teenagers that they will burn for eternity if they sexually experiment outside of marriage. The psychological torment of causing such harm cannot be under, under, understated. But more crucially, it misses the whole point of truly ethical conduct. If the only reason you act in a moral way is because you fear God's wrath, then you're not truly being moral at all. Your actions aren't driven by genuine altruism and a care for others, but by self-preservation. I'd like to think society can do better than a system of ethics founded on such depressing individualism. The, problem, the problems our society faces are complex and require a great deal of thought and care to rectify, and there's no quick fix. It helps no one to perpetuate the myth that if society was more Christian, then everything would be okay. And secularism is nothing to fear. Secularism is flexible, gladly allowing for new evidence to challenge long-held beliefs and becoming better for it. And secular democracies do not impose or officially endorse any particular belief system on their citizens as Christian societies do. In a secular free society from dogma, sorry, in a secular society free from dogma, people are encouraged to think for themselves and spread their ideas freely among their peers, promoting progress and openness to new ideas. While religious principles become outdated, stagnate, and fossilised with advances in understanding, secular principles are open to accommodate the new evidence while remaining true to core, timeless values, such as fairness, equality, and justice. For example, despite significant evidence that corporal punishment is detrimental to a productive learning environment and negatively impacts students' academic achievement and long-term well-being, on the basis of Christian teachings such as, do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. 
You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell, which is found in Proverbs 23, 13. 20 states in America still continue to condone its use. We can do better than this. Fortunately, such practices are illegal in the United Kingdom and far less widely condoned by Christians here than in America. But this difference in belief can be directly attributed to the comparative secularity of our society. In fact, countless studies have shown that the more secular a democracy is, the higher it ranks on international standards of societal well-being. The most secular democracies in the world score remarkably well on international indexes of happiness and well-being, boast the lowest violent crime and homicide rates, and fare the best with regard to life expectancy, government corruption, infant mortality, economic equality, religious and racial tolerance, women's equality, and quality of health care and education. Of course, these figures cannot prove that secularism causes these good things, but they show conclusively that secularism is by no means detrimental to them. But regardless, it stands to reason that if a society is willing to approach new ideas with an open mind, it will be far more prosperous than one which must reason cautiously within the steep walls of archaic law and dogma. According to Christianity, the greatest virtue of all is faith. In other words, belief without evidence. It's considered virtuous to live one's life on the basis of beliefs which have no empirical or logical basis. Far be it from me to stick my nose into someone else's business and tell them how they should or shouldn't live their life. If an individual wants to live their life on the basis of faith, fine. But the idea of a society and a government being run on the principle that faith is enough, or by people who think that faith is enough, is frankly repugnant. When living out one's day-to-day -day life, even the most evangelical Christians wouldn't deny the importance of evidence. I trust no one in a sober state would step out into the road wearing headphones without looking, or drink a carton of milk that was left in the fridge without checking the sell-by date. When the consequences of making decisions without evidence are immediate and clear, no right-minded person would use faith to justify their actions. Why then, if faith is not considered a good enough standard to apply day-to-day, -day, mundane activities, should we consider faith the highest virtue when it com comes to contemplating the meaning of life, the origin of universe? and the moral standards we rely upon for society to function properly. Whether you believe in God or whether you don't, consider that arguably the greatest and most incredible gift humanity has been granted is our ability to reason. I submit that society should be based on the principle that we exercise it freely and without the need to channel it within the restrictive walls of a particular religion. Thank you. Tom. Um, now go back across to Phil to have a final rebuttal on Tom's speech. So, uh, thank you, Tom. Um, there's a few things I feel um, I must address um, in what you, what you said. Um, firstly, the idea that Christians um, believe that faith is somehow opposed to evidence is just something that I don't recognise uh, from my own Christian experience um, or indeed uh, from my degree studies in theology uh, where the Christian tradition has always been that of faith seeking understanding and that the role of evidence and reason um, is a positive one and um, not something which faith can just uh, ride over. Um, so um, in arguing for a Christian basis for society, a Christian foundation. Um, I'm in no way advocating um, just kind of blind application of uh, biblical texts at random to um, solve um, politi modern day political dilemmas. Um, indeed, uh, what I was trying to argue for before is that Christianity in fact <coughs> provides the basis for um, a political realm that is different from um, and to some extent independent of the church um, even within a Christian society. Uh, I, I would go uh, to such ideas as Jesus saying uh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's for that um, and also the Apostle Paul's uh, comments about the state in the letter to the Romans. Um, so um, as I would see it, Christianity would allow um, the idea that um, the political realm is something in which we do have human freedom to seek the welfare um, of, um, of the society we find ourselves in, uh, to do that even when uh, the society is not Christian, 
um, or society is anti-Christian. Uh, but in a Christian society, um, there is an obligation for um, seeking the welfare of all. There is um, the obligation to uh, seek justice, uh, to apply wisdom, um, and to work towards a better society. Um, and the ways in which Christians would want to see that achieved uh, would be using our minds, using our brains, um, and um, not simply relying on um, kind of whatever ossified dogma and you know, kind of blind faith is, um, which uh, hasn't really played a part in my Christian experience. I was saying um, just to deal with that. Um, I find it interesting that you uh, believe the UK to be more secular than the USA, um, being uh, one of only two countries to have clerics uh, in our houses of government. Um, does anyone know the other one? Iran. It is indeed Iran. Iran. Yes, so um, yeah, that's uh, just an interesting fact for you all. Um, I want to say really that uh, Christians and a Christian society um, can't be had, you can't take the fruit um, of the Christian tradition uh, and preserve it indefinitely. Um, and to point to that, uh, I believe, um, although I may be courting controversy here, one needs only to look um, at developments in fields such as bioethics um, and medical ethics and the way in which our society treats those at both ends of life. Um, certainly, in an increasingly secularised society, uh, there does not seem to be the same Christian respect for life. Um, as would have been expected in Britain, maybe, uh, in a more religious time. Um, but uh, I would just like to leave you with some endorsements from, um, from the other side, as it were. Um, just uh, some quotes, um, perhaps expressing some of the ambivalence certain atheists uh, and agnostics feel uh, towards the idea of um, as uh, Bishop Tom Wright, who is not an atheist or a secularist, um, puts it, the idea of attaining the Christian vision of future hope without the Christian God. Um, so um, my favourite, Richard Dawkins, um, points out that uh, there are no Christians, as far as I know, blowing up buildings. I'm not aware of any Christian suicide bombers. I'm not aware of any major Christian denomination that believes the penalty for apostasy is death. And so I have mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity insofar as Christianity might be a bulwark against something worse. Um, and also, if I may briefly, Matthew Paris uh, speaks of his experience in Africa um, and uh, talks about the difference between secular and uh, Christian NGOs, uh, talks about the work of secular NGOs and says these alone will not do, education and training alone will not do in Africa Christianity changes people's hearts, it brings a spiritual transformation, the rebirth is real, the change is good. Uh, there are more quotes, but I'll leave it there. Phil, um, back to Tom to have one last final. Um, I'm going to address some points that Phil raised in his opening statement and some that he's just raised now. Um, I'll try and stick to these four so that I don't end up rambling uh, completely off the top of my head. Um, firstly, in his opening statement, he spoke a lot about tolerance and how Christianity has, well, at least become an incredibly tolerant religion. You know, um, most Christians don't have any particular problem with other religions existing. Um, they're quite happy for everyone to coexist. That's good. Um, I find it interesting, however, and this may be seen as some kind of a, an ad hominem um, attack, but I think it's worth pointing out, um, as Phil pointed out, the interesting fact about America not necessarily, at least theoretically, uh, being uh, less secular than the UK. I'd say in practice it is, considering... Um, Yes, there are a few bishops in the House of Lords, but when you consider that it's basically impossible to run for political office in America without 
claiming to be a born again Christian, um, that that to me in practice is a far less secular society, and I think it's worth pointing out. But anyway, where's it gone now? It's here somewhere. <laughs> here we go. I um, was reading on the Christian Union's website, as, as Phil said, it says, Nottingham University Christian Union is a Christian society, but open to Christians and non-believers from varying backgrounds, denominations and beliefs. Fine, perfectly amicable. It goes on to say, to be a member of the Christian Union, just sign up below. In doing this, you are declaring and agreeing to the following statement of faith. In declaring the Christian Union... In joining the Christian Union, I declare my faith in Jesus Christ as my personal Saviour, Lord and God, and the unity of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. It, it goes on anyway. If that's how you run your university Christian society, I, I wonder how, how truthful your statements are when, when you talk about not wanting to establish a theocracy. I mean, is the danger not that if society is based on Christian values, that exact same kind of thing would happen. You'd get intolerance, and you only have to look at America. Like I said, in practice, it's a lot less secular than the UK. And non-believers and Islamophobia is, is rife in America, frankly. Um, the very fact that there was even a, a reasonable kind of public debate had over whether or not a mosque should be built near Ground Zero, when there's a lot of Muslims in that area who wanted to go and worship, simply on the basis that it would be so, somehow appeasing terrorists. It, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and, and America was founded on secularism. Look where that ended up. They're, they're constantly trying to fight, you know, in the courtrooms and, and in the legislature for, for secularism to be upheld and for the beliefs of minorities to be respected. Um, I think if Christianity was the basis for society, we'd, we'd be in a situation far more dangerously close to slipping into some kind of theocracy. But I've spoken a lot about why I think Christianity would be a bad basis for society. I, I think the most important thing, I should say, is that it's simply an irrelevant uh, reason to base society on. A lot of prominent Christians have attacked humanism and secular morality on the basis that there's no foundation stone for it. There's no God-given morality that everyone can subscribe to and say, Yes, that's what we need to follow, because that's what God said. But this, this comes to the naturalistic fallacy. It's um, a problem in philosophy, basically, that you can't derive an ought from an is. You can't derive something you should do from something that is the case. Now, that doesn't usually have much problem in everyday life, um, simply because it, it's defeated when you add a clear purpose and a name to what you're doing. So, for example, if I say, I want to toast some bread, that's my goal, and the fact is that toasters toast bread, then what I should do, clearly, is put the bread in the toaster. Now, when it comes to morality, people seem to have different views on what the aim should be. Should it be to appease God's word, or should it be to try and promote human flourishing, to try and promote a better, more tolerant society? Now, you can indirectly support those things by trying to uphold God's word. But when such quotes appear in the Bible, as I've quoted already, I don't need to quote them again, you, you, you do have a, a danger of... If your main point and your main focus is trying to give effect to God's word rather than directly caring about the well-being of people, then you get, you get things like... Uh, you were saying about values um, changing uh, with regard to how we treat people at the beginning and end of life. Now, I won't talk about euthanasia because it would take too long, but at least with regard, I assume you're alluding to abortion and stem cell research, that kind of thing, yeah? I guess I can't go on. <laughs> but bear in mind whatever thought you were lingering there with at the end. Thank you. <laughs> That will go to the exciting bit, which is questions from the audience. Uh, you were I just like to give a point of information that the so called Ground Zero Mosque was neither at Ground Zero nor was it a mosque. No, well, it was near and it was a Muslim community <coughs> centre. Yeah. There's actually a mosque at Ground Zero. Yeah, so. 
Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Right. Yes. Um, you made a point earlier that you said that you thought that faith could be, uh, as it were, rec reconciled with a evidence-based view of the world. And I would like to contest that point, because essentially, as a, as a rational or scientific thinker, I start from the position of I know nothing, and I look at the world and work out how it should fit together. Whereas a faith position has some precept. It has something on which you base your system of belief, which is accepted as a prerequisite. And you, there is no logical reason for accepting that object as a prerequisite. You should not have any baseline underlying assumptions in order to build up an understanding of the world. Um, yeah, I'd say that that's um, perhaps your assumption about how epistemology works and that uh, Christians, as you rightly said, do not work um, on that kind of uh, completely blank slate um, inductive reasoning process. Um, but it's not inductive reasoning. It's replaced by the hypothecodeductive method in terms of science. Inductive reasoning is a fallacy. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry. Yeah, um, I, I just, yeah, there are actually a numbers of different ways that people think about uh, things and numbers of different ways that people go about justifying their beliefs. Um, I don't think that uh, anyone in this room uh, has a completely rational justification for every single set of their beliefs. Um, but you may want to argue the fuss on that one with me. Um, I, I do think that faith is compatible with a use of reason and um, I, I believe it was um, Jesus quoting Moses who told us that uh, the greatest thing one could do involved loving the Lord God uh, with all one's heart, soul and mind as well. So there is a positive role for that in the Christian tradition. Um, so, um, but what I was trying to get across is that um, in a uh, Christian view of politics or a society uh, run um, on a Christian foundation, uh, there is room for debate, there is room for looking at evidence-based policy um, and that we're not getting this all from the Bible. Um, and just as a point of kind of information, I, I don't think there's uh, any kind of biblically literate Christian uh, that I know who would suggest um, applying the verses quoted from Deuteronomy um, straight into UK law <coughs> either. Um, Neither am I contending that. Yeah. Um, I mean, sure, if you, if, you, if you say that these are the civil law of any country, it would be um, ancient Israel 2,000 years before Christ. But, you know, let's not argue that. I just want to yeah. ground the debate. This debate shouldn't be about whether or not the assumption behind Christianity is necessarily true, as both speakers have acknowledged. It's relevant. Less so than other points, yes. Um, you are talking about how um, one cannot take the fruit from the Christian tree without the tree rotting. So um, the values that Christian society holds um, as opposed to the beliefs behind it. Um, I would argue that this is departing from a Christian society as... Um, Many, well, the Abrahamic religions all have very similar uh, philosophies on, um, well, morality and how uh, roughly a, um, a society should be run, like loving thy neighbour, thy golden rule. Um, and this is, this is before Christianity and all Abrahamic religions in um, Plato wrote it in the uh, Republic. And I'd, I would argue that the fruit you're taking isn't something that's unique to Christianity. It's unique to not only... Uh, established um, established philosophies that people have, but people's instincts and people's um, kind of moralities that people have when they're born. They don't have to they don't have to think long and hard about it. And that um, as as you said, that there are there are atroc atrocities that um, Christian societies have um, undergone, and also secular societies. I would argue that these are not from the basis, the basis which the society is um, run on, but it's the other things in the society, and it's the hate, the hateful things in secular societies and the hateful things in Christian societies which lead to these atrocities. But 
the, be- the good basis which uh, society should be run on, I would argue, is very similar. And it's, it's irrelevant to try and stick Christianity in there. Um, oh, sorry, it wasn't really a question, it was more, <laughs> more of a comment. <laughs> did actually have something to say on that a while ago and then I just started listening and forgot what I was saying. Um, yes, um, I think that's the point I'm getting at really, is that, the, like you said, um, th- these, things aren't, these values aren't uniquely Christian. Indeed, the values that have maintained... I mean, the, the reason I quote those despicable verses from the Bible isn't because I, I'm suggesting that there, are, there is a, a mad legion of Christians out there who want to impose this on the country. That's ridiculous. But I, I bring it up to illustrate the point that the reason why we have abandoned those and preserved things like the golden rule and love thy neighbor isn't because of Christianity. It's not because of scripture. If it was because of scripture, there'd be no way to distinguish between the two because they're both equally um, promoted in the Bible and by Christian teaching. The reason why we've distinguished those principles is because they accord with our moral inclinations and what we think is good for people. And these aren't Christian values, they're secular values. You don't need religion to want the best for people and to want a decent society where we all tolerate each other. That, that is almost, it's hijacking secular morality and claiming it to be Christian in my view. Um, I'd, I'd just like to point out that actually the reason Christians don't um, follow the regulations in the law of Moses as to what to do in cases of uh, rape or you know whether to eat shellfish, etc., is precisely because of Scripture uh, and precisely because of the teaching of Jesus in the though? New Testament. Um, it, it is, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I would argue... Here we go. This is Jesus saying that everything in the Old Testament is still good law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you. Until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest part or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Whoever then relaxes one of least, sorry, whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great into the kingdom of heaven. How can you interpret that any other way? By the, I've got a quote here where Jesus says you're not allowed to reinterpret the Bible as well. Would you like me to quote that? No. Uh, I could. <laughs> I've, I've got it here. I can do it if you want to. I, I, I think we'd better move on to the okay. plenty of questions we still have in the audience. Um, yes. Um, addressing the idea of a secular society, the basis on which you seem to structure it on is one of rationalism. But I would argue that regarding the majority of players who would be involved in that structure, they're not coming from a rationalistic basis. More often than not, it's not so much seeking an abstract truth rather than what's in it for them. You know, you look at the world today, it's very much reflective of a corporate society where the people who have the most money have a bigger say. And it, I don't see any basis on which well, the ideas that you've put across counter that. It seems like a lot of the um, ideas which actually counter those um, greed, greedy ideas come about as a result of latent Christian values. If you look at the society we live in now, those ideas which lend towards a more socialist ideal, um, which lead towards regulation of the free market, which, according to your rationalist ideal, would lend itself to a laissez-faire hmm. society, or actually, if you look at, say, the industrial, you know, industrial revolution life, where that was very much allowed to go unhinged, there was great inequality, great suffering, and actually it was only when those values from the Middle Ages were reapplied, those latent Christian values were reapplied, that actually you started getting um, your regulations in terms of work hours, in terms of child, um, well, child work. It seems like without, without some sort of greater ideals which the entire society can point to, it devolves into a sense of the strong doing what they will and the weak simply being subject to it. Um, well, I'd just ask you to look at the biggest corporatop- 
democracy in the world, which is America, 80% Christian. Um, studies have shown that the most secular countries in the world are actually those that promote redistribution of wealth the most. But that's correlation, not causation. I it's not I, causation, no. I, but you're either saying that corporatocracy, corporatocracy breeds uh, Christianity or Christianity breeds corporatocracy or one thing breeds them both. Now, but the correlation is relevant still. I, I'd just like to throw some like, yeah. facts in here as well. Um, so you've like, made this fact that um, those countries which are more secular mm -hmm. are necessarily better, freer, etc. Yeah. than those countries which are not defined as secular. But given that almost all of the Western world identifies as secular, and those countries which don't identify as secular are in, have problems not because of their secular or moral underpinning, right? So, for example, the Middle East has problems independent of exactly secular, uh, secularization, right? Those countries in Africa which have particular problems are not due to the fact that they have a secular or non-secular underpinning. So surely that particular fact as a justification um, for all the other facts that you made well, is harmful to this. We, um, as you said, we shouldn't be going into whether or not uh, Christianity is, is true or not, but I, I think the reason for that is simply because um, as people start to think more rationally, they in turn become less religious. And you, you see a correlation between societies that are least religious and societies that are most prosperous simply for that reason, because the more rational you are, the more prosperous but again, that you become. Falls, you know, it falls prey to the folly that people are behaving down on a rationalistic basis when actually they're not. In what, Whether they're religious or not, they're acting on their own prejudices, their own desires. You know, people won't be, you know, people won't be looking to uphold these values. Well, that as you I put across, if they go against their own interests, I think that's clear. You look at America, where you get um, a strong conservative angle, where it's a case of I make more money, so I don't want it to go to people who have less money mm. to their detriment and. What's to, what's to stop people from upholding that if they're in the majority? There's no underlying belief that all life is sacred, that all life is valuable, and so there's no impetus well, on which to regulate against it, and especially if the majority hold a view that is antithetical to that. I think you're making quite a an offensive remark regarding people who aren't religious, in that they don't regard life as sacred. I, I'm sure... No. I'm sure many religious people do believe that. Not that they don't, but that there's, whether you do or you don't doesn't affect what happens if the rich and powerful person puts across a view that goes against it. You know, if, and it goes back to if you have a situation where it's profitable to disregard human value, it's likely that, you know, under market forces, it's, there's going to be a tendency to move well, in that direction. What's it, to regulate against? It will always be profitable to do that if you're the strongest. I mean, I think that's uh, what uh, Darwin and evolution has shown us. That's how we got where we are. But that doesn't mean that you have to advocate that in the social sphere, social Darwinism. And it, like, like I was saying, whether it's religious morality or secular morality, the distinction is that in one case you're being told you should do this, otherwise you will burn in hell. In the other sense, you're saying, I want to do this for the betterment of my fellow people. Now, which one is more selfish? Well, I would argue that the one way you're trying to preserve yourself, and that is the basis for your society, that is the more selfish. But when you say you are... I'm, I'm going to have to... It can't be a discussion as other people have questions. I'd, I'd like to interject something here, though. The, um, you, you speak about... <laughs> the, um, sorry, but it's quite important. Altruistic behaviour can be demonstrated to evolve in nature, and indeed, it's the, the basis. The, the, you talk about latent Christian values. These latent Christian values, as you call them, existed long before Christianity ever did. The values of uh, preserving human life and the values of uh, the, just the, the, the social interactions that people have, the, the exchange, um, doing each other favours, all that kind of stuff, it, it all evolves. It, it, you, you can see it happening in, in, in primitive forms in various animal species, and there is very good logic to understand how this can arise in nature. It does not require a Christian basis to be the case. I, 
I think like that trying to go back into it, I think what he tried to say was that there are moral claims that need to be justified in some sort of sphere. And what might be true that there are limited amounts of altruism in nature and amongst people without common characteristics or common religions. I think what the gentleman is trying to say is those moral claims are reinforced with the idea of like a Christian society. Now, why that might, whilst that might not necessarily be true, I think that itself isn't particularly harmful. I think that's what you were trying to say. Um, and though, like, even though nature might have some altruistic so, tendencies, all we all, are nature. True. Okay, right. Like there are some altruistic tendencies are, in society. Uh, altru- that doesn't necessarily mean that's what's yeah. best for society as a whole, which is what the motion is today. I mean, I don't have to be impartial, so I'll say this: I think you're overstepping your impartiality. <laughs> okay. I'll say that. Well, I mean, you said that he's overstepping his impartiality with the new audience. I, I just tried to clarify yeah. that yeah. person's comments, since clarification is important in a debate with this many members. I was just trying to clarify things. <laughs> yes. I'll ask a different question to get off the topic. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so, to Phil, um, do you think if there was a, a society founded on Christianity, how do you think that would affect the rights of other religions? Um, that's a very good question, uh, both in view of um, kind of the historical case, which has not always been good. Um, and in, in view of what uh, I said previously about the idea of a limited state and the idea that uh, because only God is sovereign, we recognize the limits of the state and we do not um, want the state to coerce um, or to enforce um, kind of religious orthodoxy, that um, yeah, Christianity does provide the basis for a society where uh, the voices uh, and contributions um, and citizenship of um, those who are not Christians are fully respected. Um, just as an aside, um, the Christian background I come from uh, happens to be Baptist. Um, now, years back, 300 years back, uh, the Baptists themselves were on the wrong end of an intolerant society um, because the law was that you had to go to a Church of England church. Um, and you, you couldn't go to um, Oxford or Cambridge, you couldn't be part of the professions if you were a non-conformist Christian. So um, I think that that's actually really unchristian, and I would not want a return to that kind of uh, thing, which is exactly uh, why I've been very careful to point out that I'm not arguing for a theocracy where the government enforces um, one particular version of Christianity or any kind of Christianity at all. Um, So for a uh, member of another religion or someone who is not a member of any religion, um, I do not think that a Christian society um, such as I've described uh, would provide them with anything to fear. In fact, they would be uh, perfectly at liberty to come spout their godless opinions in Parliament and win votes and make laws. So... Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, a quick point on um, tying with a few things. I think it's important to say that a model of um, a society that may work amazingly for one country will not necessarily work for another. So, and I'm sure there are um, points that people in, let's say, Iran would generally agree with the mass of the public, but people here would find horrific. And I think that, also your point on um, bishops and the House of Lords, although I think as I'm a humanist and I believe in a secular society, so there's a danger of um, Christianity leaking into lawmaking. I think they do play a role because so many people are Christian in this country, although it's a lot less than before. And so many people, although they may not have a very Christian life, go to church and it's a meeting place for a lot of the public. Um, So I'm saying that although a Christian society may work very well in the UK, and quite a lot of the laws are uh, latent from an era where almost everyone in the lawmaking process was Christian, I'm saying that for a foundation, because from the title, it's a foundation for any society. Not just not just the UK, mm-hmm. and I think that although lo- lots of your points are brilliant and it works amazingly in this country, it shouldn't be held as 
more con concrete morals because I don't believe morals can be concrete. <laughs> it's not the statement, was it? Yeah, it, it was. Sorry, it wasn't the question. <laughs> yes. I guess like it, it almost sounds like from what the trade's been saying that like Christianity is like the imposition of morality almost that, that that's what or that kind of based on so I guess the Old Testament would be like defining the law and that would have a lot in common with Judaism. But from my understanding of what the Bible says, the main message of Christianity isn't moralism, it's um, it is freedom from moralism or freedom from an uh, and accountability to the law that is defined by the Old Testament. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of hard when you talk about like this app, this Christianity being like this Christian state it would apply it would be this application of morality that comes from the Bible. And yeah, in that way, if if that was what the argument was, I think you could justifiably say, well, why don't you have a, a morality that comes from a different religion or from human thought? But I don't think that's actually what the message of Christianity is. It's, it's, and, and like your point before where you were saying about how Jesus said there wouldn't be anything from the Lord that would, that would pass away actually what Paul says later on in Galatians he says when I tried to live by the law I, it didn't work so I died to the law so Jesus isn't saying that the law is no longer applied like it still stands but the message of Christianity is that the death to the law um, through Jesus is what my understanding would be so, so in some ways I think it's kind of missing the point when we're saying we're arguing about um, the imposition of morality. Well, obviously, um, this is why it's so hard to have such a broad question as, as this. Um, everyone has their own uh, view on what Christianity means to them, what it means to society, what, what the word just should mean. And um, if I've been arguing against something which isn't what you believe as a Christian, then fine. I've been arguing against Christianity 1 and you believe in Christianity 2, so it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily say that's my opinion. I would say that's. My opinion. Okay, yeah, that's your understanding. But that's what I mean. I mean, everyone's got a different understanding of what Christianity is. Now, I personally would believe that if you were brought up Christian two thousand years ago, when the texts were first written, well, a thousand eight hundred years or so, then you you would not have that kind of tolerant view as a Christian that you have now. And I would argue that that has been imported into Christianity through thousands of years, sorry, hundreds of years of secular, moral, philosophical uh, reasoning and, and, and advancement. Now, I decided to argue against the Christianity as represented in the Bible, partly, on the basis that that is what I think Christianity should mean. And as soon as you start selecting certain bits from the Bible and taking other bits away, and it, you're, you're distorting original Christianity. Now, that's what I'm arguing against. I'm not mean? arguing against what a Christian might think nowadays with the, the insights of, of rational thinking that many Christians have today. I, I wouldn't argue against that, depending on what particular things they believe. I wouldn't argue against that. Um, so there's there's a danger of being at cross purposes. I think. I, I, th I think I'd just like to say, if you were born a Christian in the second century, you'd probably understand the value of religious tolerance. Um, um, and do you want me to quote? And that? not want to be thrown to the lions, as so many of you were. But, um, you only I, have to look I, at the Crusades say, hundreds of years after that. It's important that each speaker has a chance. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say to the question of that um, I found that a very helpful interjection. Yes, um, Christianity is not about um, it, it is not about um, a law um, that makes me righteous with God. No, not at all. Um, that's probably the biggest misunderstanding of Christianity that I come across um, in my day to day life. Um, but I do think that um, Christianity, although um, it is exactly as you described, um, this uh, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, um, I do think that it also has implications for how Christians should think about the wider world. 
um, and their involvement and responsibility towards the society that they're in, which um, comprises Christians and non-Christians. Um, and um, I do think that there is a role for Christian political involvement, and that's what I've been trying to outline. So um, I'm sorry if I gave the impression that Christianity was all about morality. Um, I absolutely don't believe that for a minute. Um, um, I don't know if maybe I'm missing some point, but I'm, I'm still struggling to sort of see the difference in practical application of what you're both arguing for. Because it seems like you're saying Christianity is a good foundation because the church would be separate from the state and there would be religious toleration, and so you could be a politician and be a Christian, and so you know, you, that would influence your um, policy making. Um, but if, if there was a secular society, you can still be religious and Christian, and you can be a politician. So I'm not really sure where the difference comes into, because it, it, religion is the private thing, and you can be in the government as a religious person, as long as all of the government isn't defined by religion. So yeah, I, I, I think the, the difference, difference comes uh, exactly as you said there, religion being a private thing. Um, and the difference would be um, whether in public discourse religious reasoning um, was accepted um, as you know, a valid reason that people could put forward um, for what they believed. Um, now, a lot of um, secularist thought uh, actually says that no, um, in, a, in an equal society we should have respect for each other and not use reasoning which is inaccessible or incomprehensible to someone who does not share um, my beliefs. So um, Christians can argue against abortion based on medical evidence but not um, based on uh, their religious views about the sanctity of life or life beginning at conception etc. But I believe that actually goes beyond having equality of persons and actually uh, kind of in, invokes a weird kind of uh, equality of reasoning by saying that reasoning has to be equally accessible to everyone, um, which um, if you just apply it to religion might seem okay, uh, but it's actually absurd when you apply it to normal models of political discourse. Um, so someone who is a supply-side reformist econ economist might just be spouting complete gibberish to someone on the other side of the House of Commons benches um, because they believe in something ultimately unprovable. Um, and yeah, so if we allow people to um, appeal to political belief systems or philosophical <laughs> belief systems, uh, why should we not allow people to refer to religious belief systems in their public reasoning um, and I don't think that um, strong versions of secularism give an adequate account of that. Um, I think they try and shut down religion in a very totalitarian and sinister way. Um, I think we're in complete agreement. Uh, it sounds to me like you've redefined Christianity to be secularism. I've already said that but there seems to be no difference between the secularism that I've been talking about and everything that you've been talking about. I, I never said that people shouldn't be allowed to express religious views in the House of Commons or anything like that. Uh, to me, the entire point of secularism is that there is no official sponsored dogma. Whether it's religious or whether it's reason, you're not, you're not saying to someone, because that's religious, you're not allowed to say that in the House of Parliament. That's, that's not secularism, and I think you, you would be... Um, it would be dangerous to assume that that's what secularism is because the whole point of secularism is freedom not just from religion as a state endorsed and a state condoned way of thinking but any any dogma all all ideas are free to be expressed in a secular state not my bottle over <laughs> I'm, I'm very heartened that we agree on that actually um, many sections more like a dialect that I've, I've met um, would, would exclude religious reasoning from public discourse maybe we can go together afterwards and sort out Evan Harris so. yes <laughs> and the green shirt uh, this is just Tom you said that uh, when you were talking about America that it's founded on a secularist idea Mm. You then said that eighty percent of it is now Christians. It seems to me that if a secular society had worked, there would be more secular people in America. 
Um, I, I think this is a very American problem. Um, it's, it's a problem of misinformation, in, in my opinion. Um, there's, without going into specifics, in my view, there's a lot of um, misinformation spouted by very large political parties in America regarding the Constitution. And I'd say, maybe not a majority, but enough for it to make a massive difference, uh, believe that it is a Christian nation. Um, and they want to impose that on other people. I'm, yeah, <laughs> it, in practice, is a Christian nation in, in my view, because well, argue that if the state had an official uh, secular society in charge, then it would have done um, progressed towards secular society because people realised that was a good way of running society. And society would be more friendly. Not necessarily. I mean, um, you you also need a fair and balanced media. You need, um, you know, the, there are many there are many things which could. Um, which could cause misinformation to get out there. You don't need it to be official government policy for, for people to get deluded. Uh, the gentleman in the blue jacket. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, Tom. Um, I, was, I was sort of waiting how long it would take for the, uh, the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition to come out. I was like, oh, brilliant. Because they're probably the most non Christian things that have happened in history. Um, which is brilliant, even though they're under the name of Christianity, they, they just completely weren't. Um, so then I thought, um, what? Um, sort of societies have gone under the name of atheism and secularism. Mm. I hope you'd bring this up, go on. Of, um, uh, Hitler's Nazi Germany, mm. uh, yeah. Stalin, uh -huh. Russia, Pol Pot's Cambodia, right. um, German Mao's China, I don't think Japan, which is about 200 million deaths there. Right. I, I can't think, with regard to any of those countries, that the reason why they did what they did was because of secularism. There was no respect in those societies for freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of political representation. Um, the I I no, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that they were truly secularists or truly atheists. Well, there you go. I'm just saying if you're talking about the Crusades as being Christian, but that was done the name of on the basis of scripture. And on the basis, yeah, on the basis of the Pope. well, yes, interpreting scripture. I mean, that's what I mean. The, the problem really is dogma, not religion in that, in that respect. And all of these societies that you've mentioned, Pol Pot, um, <coughs> Nazi Germany, you know, Soviet Russia, they, they were all run under systems of dogma, where opposition what's, what's to the dogma, official sorry? dogma. Is that like not a cat? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to come up here and do some jokes, mate? <laughs> um, do, do you actually want me to define dogma, or was that just... Right. Um, um, State-sponsored uh, political view that you have to follow? I don't, I've not got a dictionary. It's not necessarily um, state-sponsored. Um, any, any, any. Essentially any view which is um, concrete and inflexible and held generally based yeah. on some form of Which scriptural underlying text. It's not allowed to challenge. It's a I term often that. used surrounding scripture, given that yes. you have to adhere to scripture. Um, yeah. Whilst it's not necessarily exclusive to scripture. Okay, thank um, you. You've been waiting a long time. Yeah. I think that, uh, sort of in the end, the thing that sort of be the best foundation of society, I mean, regardless of Christianity or secularism, is simply not to be, not to take anything too far. I mean, that seems to be what we've sort of all been arguing about. I mean, sort of the Pol, Pol Pot and things, the sort of take, taking away religion in that case was simply a way to frankly stop stop uh, dissent. Because, as you've noted, that churches are great meeting places for people. And that, that can, in many places, end up in to political ideology. But I, said, I think that generally it's... It's more about being moderate about things. I mean, very, very. Uh, I don't think that sort of a secular state in where sort of as America seems to try to be, that claim, claims to be secular and goes to the extent of saying that, uh, say for instance, teachers aren't allowed to discuss religion in classrooms. And I think that's absurd. As I think that everyone is entitled to their opinions. Um, that they, people ought to be able to share them. 
It's just sort of making sure that you don't, that no one's having their opinions forced on them. I, I think that um, moderation is great in many things, um, but in other things, um, <coughs> not so much. Um, there are certain injustices and oppressions around the world to which my reaction uh, is anything but moderate. Um, I don't think that the world needs a moderate reaction to the crisis in the Sudan. I don't think the world needs a moderate reaction to Robert Mugabe. Um, but, you know, that's what we're going to get. So, there we go. Um, but yeah, um, moderation is good. But um, sometimes, the, the, I mean, the, there are things in everyday life. Can you can you love too much? Is is, is it like getting a little bit carried away? If, you know, I'm just too loving to people. Moderation, so. moderation. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes. There's such a thing as stalkers. I think that's loving too much. Who have you been talking to? The gentleman with the headphones. Um, wouldn't we say as well that at the moment in our country Christianity is on a decline and is at the moment is, is the lowest it's been in our country in hundreds of years and secularism is on the incline yeah our country's in one of the worst positions it's been in in terms of like finance and crime and whatnot it's in one of the worst positions it's been in years so what would you say to that? Um, I'd simply say that they're not it, there's no causative link between the two, is what I'd say. Um, uh, I can't really add much more than that, because I'm not an economist. Well, I would say, use that argument when you said the opposite, that um, more secularism led to a hierarchy. Well, that's because you've got lots of examples from lots of different countries, and you can do a meta-analysis. So you're looking at one phenomenon. Aren't you picking and choosing? When you you can't just take one, one country. and I mean, the, the entire know. world is in an economic... Uh, uh, mess right now, not just secular countries. Um, America is probably steeped in the most debt, and like I said, um, yeah. that's a very, I wouldn't say theocracy, obviously, but it's not particularly secular, is how I'd describe it. Yeah, that's, I mean, the important thing is that we don't stop believing in the unstoppable force of human progress, um, from the dinosaurs to the Enlightenment and to the stars. Um, because, yeah, that's definitely true if history is taught us anything. Um, that's what I really want to say. Um, the woman in the back jumper. I've recently returned from a, a month long trip in Kenya, and when I went there, I was in a, a very Christian sort of environment. I was actually staying in a slum. And I, I spent a lot of time with these Christian families who spent all their time talking about how God will get them out of their poor position. And they, they spent a lot of time in church and praying instead of um, actually working and like putting their efforts into getting themselves out of their position by working. They were just putting all their sort of hard efforts in faith rather than work. And I visited a refugee camp as well. And uh, for example, there was a mother there and her baby had malaria. And instead of sort of looking towards medicine and helping the child, she was just looking towards God and saying that God will help her child instead of like a more rational view, what, what would you say about that? Um, it sounds like that made you angry, and I'm glad it made you angry because it makes me angry too. Um, what you're describing is all too common in the developing world. It's um, a form of theology uh, called the prosperity gospel, which teaches that if you've got enough faith, God will give you health and wealth. Um, and it's not at all what the church has historically taught um, or what you'll find in the Bible. Um, and um, I mean, I'm really passionate about seeing proper theological education among Christians worldwide so that they don't fall prey to that kind of bad teaching. Um, but it does go to show um, that uh, what we believe does affect uh, the way we live our lives and uh, the way we'll end up with um, a flourishing society or not. So um, thank you for that. Um, yes, um, I, I tried to say this at the end of my uh, rebuttal, um, but I didn't quite get round to it. I think it's quite relevant now. I mean, this is exactly the point. When uh, a belief unsubstantiated by evidence dictates what you do in such a way, it's, in, it's incredibly, uh, it can be incredibly life destroying. I mean, it's all good and well to have vague faith about something that's 
probably not going to happen within our lifetimes, such as the return of Christ, because that wouldn't directly influence your day-to-day -day life. But when it comes to something like the belief in prayer as an effective way to deal with problems, um, I mean, I, I think it's quite astounding that you say Christianity doesn't teach that. Christianity does teach, and, and bishops and ministers and priests often teach that prayer is an effective way to deal with uh, problems. You know, they'll say, pray for your loved ones, do this, do that. How many of them, well, they probably do say go to the doctor as well. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, this, this really comes to the fore when it comes to something like stem cell research. Now, the belief propagated by Christianity that the soul enters the body at the point of conception, that has caused untold um, continued suffering. If, if Christianity hadn't imposed this belief, well, not imposed, if, I suppose if that belief didn't pervade, then, and, and as I say, it's unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated by evidence, then stem cell research would be decades ahead of where it is now, and funding would be far greater. Because th this idea that you've got a soul that en enters the body at the point of conception means that Christians will say, well, because a blastocyst, which is what um, stem cell, uh, particularly um, embryonic stem cell research, the most promising form, is conducted on, that's a three-day-old fetus, or embryo, rather. Now, at that stage in an embryo's development, it's still possible for it to split in two and for a fully-fledged human being to come out of one of that, that split. Now, what would Christianity say? Would it say that the soul has split in two? What happens to this person? It, it's simply a belief which doesn't make any sense and which has stopped research into this incredibly promising area of medicine, which has been shown great promise in curing and, and dealing with Alzheimer's disease and various forms of cancer, simply because these cells can change into any other cell in the body. It's very profound in science and, and medicine. And that kind of faith is incredibly detrimental to, to progress in that area. And I would say that that is endemic of faith in all areas. There will always be something that will be harmed in your life by a belief which is unsubstantiated by evidence. Somewhere along the line, you'll make the wrong decision because you had faith in something which wasn't true. And when it comes to something like that, that is fundamentally important. And it's, it's why, and as I'm saying, you know, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not for some kind of House of Commons where you're not allowed to bring up faith statements as evidence, but I would like to see a future where more people reason and less people have to have faith in that kind of uh, unsubstantiated belief. I'd, I'd say just quickly that Christians do believe that that belief is substantiated. And um, I know. If, uh, if, if Christians are right, um, if um, life does begin at conception, then it is not all right to mess with human beings, uh, to use them as spare parts in medical experiments. Well, um, and that way, just um, the horrors um, of all sorts of um, things lie. And I am I'm not, sorry, but to, yeah. to, to, to place, to, we're, we're can I just say, this is very quick, if, if, to if place it's on a, a higher pedestal. Top. If it's going to be a stem cell debate, this will never end. No, <laughs> this is a very <laughs> key point. Um, I'm, 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 I, even if it might be, I think we need to go on to the last two questions, okay. perhaps. So, um, you and then. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, You've been waiting for a long while, so you have to go see. Um, my question, is it Phil? Uh, yes. Yes, um, you all seem, you seem to be arguing that Christianity is a good foundation because it's just and it's equal and it's fair, and Tom seems to be arguing that secularism is a good foundation because it's good and it's equal and it's fair. And it's, but what can Christianity provide for a foundation of society that secularism can't? Or rather, to rephrase the question, what can Christianity provide as a result of it, that can only come from Christianity that no sense can provide. Um, I think Christianity happens to give a more coherent and complete account um, of the reasons for uh, believing that human beings are valuable um, and that we should uh, look out for the poor and the elderly and the infirm. Um, and all of the things that um, secularism, certainly in this country, wants to say. 
um, it says because it's appropriated them from the Christian tradition. Um, it's spending historic Christian moral capital in that sense, um, which is why secularisms that grow out of other religious traditions look very different um, to the kind of secularism we get uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, so I would say simply that Christianity uh, actually provides a reason to believe and a reason to hope um, and a reason to hold the human being um, as inherently dignified and valuable. Um, I am going to bring back stem cell research, but I'm afraid no, as a, okay. it, it is completely relevant. You say it's consistent. I, is this an example of a consistent belief? Right now, there are millions, not just thousands, millions of people suffering from cancer, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, autism. These are all things which stem cell research promises very very well, there's great promise that this can develop cures and, and, and ways that we can alleviate the pain of these people. Is it consistent to place on the pedestal the well-being of a three-day-old embryo which has less cells in it by a factor of about 20 than the brain of a fly? Okay, I'm to that many people I and that much assume. suffering. Is that consistent? I can assume your answer. Um, and I think the audience can as well. So moving on to the last question. Um, well, um, my, my understanding of the um, family partners of America was sort of pretty much equally divided between Christians on a longer continuum from atheism and, and basically atheists that couldn't say they were atheists because it would have been politically you know, possible to do that and hold positions like this. Um, and and, and I, I think that I've got so many thoughts in my head that I think I better just stop there. <laughs> um, I'll just ramble. So. Right, so, do you guys have any like thirty second closing remarks? Not about anything other than stem cell research. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather stay away from that song. But, uh, no, I, I that's... wonder why. Go on, carry on. Ooh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right, uh, I think that seems like a good time to stop it. Um, a quick summary vote. So if everyone could line themselves up again. Uh, those who vote in favour of Phil, in terms of Christian um, morality behind society, please raise your hands down. Nice and high. Well, this has been productive. And are there any abstentions? Oh, right. Um, it's 25-21, so a uh, net point increase for Tom. Yeah, some people will come in. Ah, yes. that's, that's <laughs> why when you wrote the first one down, I thought if no one had changed their minds. No, no. Okay. Yes. Um, right then, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And if there are any remarks from you. Um, if you want to chat some more, feel free or come and chat to these guys about things that maybe you want to discuss. Maybe not for too long. Um, just some things to flag up. Um, the Secular Society do lots of debates and things, so if you want to oh, get involved... Try to learn about, yeah. And if you want to debate, please do so. <laughs> yeah, we try to organise as many as we can. Um, it's most society are reluctant to do it. I was very happy when we actually agreed to do this. Yeah. Um, um, also, tomorrow the Christian Union at 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock for Peter Town for what we call a lunch bar. The topic is uh, what, how can we trust an ancient book? So maybe the ideas in scripture, come and find out what Christians think. And if you want a bit of the Bible, we've got um, some Gospels if anyone wants to take one away and find out some more. Um, and a massive round of applause for these guys.